So I promised some people that I would make a video of me telling my testimony and share it. So before I begin, uh, I want to read Revelations 12, 11. It says, And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimonies. That means that our testimonies are extremely powerful. I know that mine is, and I hope by sharing this I'm able to inspire those who are still lost. Um, I know what it's like to lose hope and have none at all, it can be completely empty of it. And I also know that it can be found. And I hope that I'm able to touch someone's life with my story. My past is filled with a lot of darkness. And I believe to this day that it was the darkness that led me to find life, that led me to God, um, that led me to find who I truly am. Um, as a child, uh, it would have been said that I had a very promising future. Um, my childhood was filled with a lot of imagination. Um, I have always been very smart, artistic, compassionate, ambitious. Um, I've always had a very great sense of empathy. I remember I was always happy. When I was about nine, I was diagnosed with severe PTSD, depression, uh, because of some trauma that I had experienced in my life at that point. Um, when I was about 11 years old, um, my close friend CJ shot himself in the head with a 22 caliber rifle after he got off the phone with me. Um, I remember him telling me that he would call me back and he never did. And I think the fact that he would never call me back because he couldn't call me back um, was the final amount of darkness that completely smothered the bright, happy, optimistic little girl that I used to be. I remember praying for CJ that God would bring him out of ICU, uh, that he would survive, but he didn't and he died three days later. I remember there was like this huge shift in my perception on life. Um, I didn't feel depressed or sad. I felt immense despair. And I just couldn't understand how this God that I prayed to, how he would take away this little boy's life. And um, I spent a, a good bit of my life blaming myself and wondering if it were something that I had said to him when I was on the phone with him that caused him to do this. And I never really understood any of that. That pain stayed with me for years and it really never, it never really left. Um, after that, I pretty much became completely atheist at the age of 13 and nothing could convince me that there was a God. In ninth grade, I continued homeschool and I met new friends and those friends were a little older than me and they introduced me to tripping on DXM. If you don't know what DXM is, it's the um, active ingredient in over-the-counter cough medication and uh, when taken at really high doses it can act as a disassociative similar to ketamine or PCP. Um, I spent a lot of time uh, during those years, uh, I spent about six years tripping on DXM daily, delving into uh, other spiritual practices like Wicca and even uh, finding myself reading the uh, the satanic bible and um, I was searching for something spiritual and all these things but I found them all to be completely empty. 15 years old I was stealing laptops um, out of Best Buy. I was arrested six times as a juvenile for shoplifting and spent jail time at the juvenile delinquent center in Memphis. I met my first boyfriend um, when I was about 15 and I stayed with him until I was 18 when I had my daughter Adelira. Um, I was extremely overwhelmed by being a teen mom and dropped out of high school in 12th grade. Um, my mom helped me greatly with my responsibilities of being a mother. Um, and I was a great mom but my depression was greater and my love for drugs was vast. By the time I was 19, it would I would have been considered pretty emotionally unstable. <laughs> uh, I had been to several behavioral health hospitals um, several times for suicide attempts, self-mutilation, disassociative delusions, you name it. Um, I had been 
diagnosed with PTSD, major depression, borderline personality disorder, and this was all while I was completely unmedicated. Um, <clears throat> when I was 20, I started drinking and taking Xanax daily. And when I was like 21, I had my first overdose after I took about 20 Xanax bars, 22 milligram Xanax bars and drank a, um, a gallon, half gallon, of Captain Morgan. And um, I went into a coma and was in the in ICU as a Jane Doe for three days with no brain activity on life support. And nobody knew where I was. My family had no idea. And I was, com I was out of town actually when it happened. Um, I woke up on the third day though, and uh, at that time though, I, I mean, it was just like, I didn't think that God had woke me up, I just thought I woke up. Like, I know that that's not true. I know that um, he had his hand on me the whole time. In 2013, I experienced several back-to-back -back traumatic experiences in a month, including the death of my best friend, uh, my parents divorced after about 20 years, um, and uh, my daughter had been abused. And after everything that happened, my purpose seemed to be defeated. After that, I had so much hate for myself, and it left me with a heavy, dreadful sadness that I couldn't shake. And so I woke up one morning, and I... I decided that uh, the only thing that was going to make my life any better or make it worth living or bearable at the least was to start doing heroin and so I did. After I started using heroin in 2013, I never stopped doing it. The heroin took every little bit of me that was left away. I snorted it for about six months and all my money and possessions were depleted in the midst of heroin's invasion on my life. He was homeless and he had let heroin destroy his life. I took him in and got him off the streets and in return he introduced me to the needle. Within weeks my mom had kicked me out of her house and I was homeless with him, living in our car. Um, I knew that heroin was destroying me, but it's all I wanted. I made hundreds of dollars every day panhandling just to be broke and dope sick by the next morning. Um, I owned nothing but uh, a collection of old used syringes and some dirty clothes I probably would have never even worn. I had gone from my initial weight of 170 pounds down to 115 pounds and uh, I was really bad. I didn't look like me or act like me um, and there was only one thing that I wanted and it was dope. Um, my mom was taking care of my daughter at that point, and I I was just empty inside. I was so dead, like nothing mattered. Not the love for my child, the love for my family. Nothing overpowered how much heroin had a hold of me. Um, so in May of 2015, my mom realized that something was majorly wrong. Um, she realized that I was addicted to heroin, and... She took custody of my daughter, and after that, I just kind of gave up. As if I didn't already give up all, all the times before that. This time, I really gave up. I hated life. I loved my daughter, but the pain and the, the sense of failure was just too great for me to handle. Um, in 2016, I was arrested for heroin possession, as well as my first felony. Theft of property, 1000 to 10000 I was put on um, drug court. And I moved into a halfway house and I stayed clean for a couple of months. Um, I obtained a job and was doing good for a while. And then uh, I said, screw it. And I uh, tried to commit suicide. Um, I nearly succeeded until uh, my friend found me unconscious in a bathtub full of blood. Um, I had slit my wrist worse than ever before. And I had lost so much blood that I really shouldn't have been alive for the not the first time, but this would have been a lot of times that I shouldn't have been a lot. Uh, I was eventually sentenced to the penal farm, and uh, while I was in jail, uh, my dad supported me in pretty much every way possible. Um, our relationship started to mend, and my mind started to clear, and 
I had no intentions of using heroin when I got out. I was finally released in 2017 and everything was great for a couple of days and then I tried meth. It wasn't long before my drug of choice was meth and heroin combined and um, I eventually got back with my boyfriend and um, our relationship and addiction picked up right where it left off before. Only this time we were enraged by methamphetamine and it was way worse. Uh, we were really abusive to each other and would like physically fight every single day, like beat the crap out of each other for probably no reason whatsoever. Um, and it was very toxic. I was forced to start escorting online. It was something that I was completely against. Uh, I had a deep-seated hatred for it. And it was something that I promised myself that I would never do. Um, and looking back, all the things that I said I would never do, I ended up doing. So be careful about the things that you say you'll never do. I was raped. And, uh... I was beaten and stranded in the parking lot, and uh, it was through this horrible situation that I became pregnant with my son. I started using more and more fentanyl, more meth, endless amounts, hoping that I would have a miscarriage. I never thought that I would say that ever about my own child, but when you conceive a child through rape, it's a whole different, different story. I had the money for an abortion several times, but it was like every time I tried to go get the abortion, something would happen. We'd get in a car wreck, or they'd lose my appointment, or I'd have to reschedule. It just kept getting pushed off further and further, and it was like it, something was preventing it from happening. Um, me and my boyfriend were wanted by the Memphis Police Task Force. Uh, we had been selling drugs, buying and selling guns off the street, burglarizing buildings, stealing cars. Uh, we were in several really bad high-speed chases, um, one in which we hit two officers who were apparently on foot behind our car. Um, but it's crazy how when you're that messed up on dope that you don't even realize what's going on around you. I was on Mid-South's Most Wanted, me and my boyfriend, um, and they were looking for us. And I was eventually arrested when I was seven and a half months pregnant. And uh, I had been using meth and heroin, fentanyl, heavily the entire time, the entire pregnancy. Um, and I believe, you know, at that point, I never thought that this baby I would take, bring this, this pregnancy would get to term. Like, I pretty much was hoping that I would lose the baby. When I finally got to jail, I went through one of the worst cold turkey detoxes of my life. I had cold turkey detoxed in jail like numerous times, but this one was the worst. Um, a few days into my detox, Shelby County um, forced me to go to the methadone clinic. And so um, while I was there, I got this amazing idea that I was going to... Uh, beat the officer who was transporting me and escaped from their custody. And so I did. <laughs> I made it a, kind of far-ish until uh, I didn't make it far. <laughs> and uh, a, somebody, some dude, eventually tackled me on my pregnant belly onto the concrete and I was detained. <laughs> um, I knew like when I fell that um, that, that was it, that, that I wasn't pregnant anymore. And uh, they sent me back to jail where I was put in a cell alone by myself on 23 and one, which is um, where you're locked in a cell for 23 hours a day and you get to come out for one hour and you get nothing in there, nothing in your cell whatsoever. They finally took me to the ER and I found out that um, I found out that my baby had been completely unharmed by my fall on the concrete. Um, my baby was thriving and he was healthy despite of my complete lack of prenatal care and nutrition. I also found out that my baby was a boy with tiny fingers and tiny toes. I heard his heart beat and I watched him suck his thumb and it hurt my heart so bad to know that 
I didn't want him, and then I, had, I couldn't have him. And I still in my mind at this point thought that there's no way I'm having this baby. Um, it hurt so bad to know how callous my heart had become by the streets and by my addiction. I thought back and I realized that throughout my pregnancy I had put myself in so many countless situations that end pregnancies, um, but nothing harmed my baby. While I was in jail, I was locked in my cell for 90 days and um, with nothing but a Bible. No paper, no pen, no commissary, no snacks, no phone calls, no mail, nothing but a Bible. And um, at this point, I literally picked my Bible up out of boredom. And what I found in its tiny print was my soul. I know that God spoke to me while I was in that cell and he told me that my baby wasn't my rapist baby, that he was my baby. And he told me that he was sent to save me. And, you know, being an atheist for years, um, that's a big deal to know that God spoke to me. He opened my eyes and he warmed my heart and um, he told me that my baby was meant to be born and nothing was gonna stop that from happening. And all the evidence of the past several months proved that. And everything started making sense, that God had his hand on him, that he was protected, that he was special, that he had purpose and that I had purpose. And um, things started changing within me. I started getting down on my knees in my jail cell and praying every single morning, every single night, and, and thanking God for everything that he had got me through. Um, and I had never prayed like that since CJ died when I was 11. And so I started praying and my family wouldn't speak to me. My boyfriend was too busy making sure I was the very last thing on his list of things to care about, you know? And uh, so I spent that 90 days in jail by myself with that Bible. And I knew that I didn't need anybody else. I knew that I had what it took to be a mother. And I knew that God would make sure that my baby was born, and that he was healthy and uh, that he would guide me right where I needed to be. So I had my son in April 2019 and I named him Jasper. Um, I ha instantly had such an intense love for him. Um, our bond was and still is unbreakable. Um, he was born addicted to methadone and had to detox from it for 90 days in the NICU but he did it with no issues. Um, the baby's system all the way back from conception to see if the mother had abused drugs and nothing showed up. I had used meth and fentanyl heavily, shooting it daily um, and nothing showed up. His tests were completely negative. He was thriving, he was beautiful he was perfect and nothing harmed him i was sent to a rehab for pregnant women and um i stayed there for like four months and uh i hadn't talked to anybody my family nobody had spoken to me at all whatsoever um and then one day uh, I remember when I was pregnant with my son, I called my mom and I asked her, when I was in jail, I asked her if she would take custody of my son, you know, if I had him in jail. And she said, no, Ashley, you don't need another baby. And we pretty much hung up and I didn't speak to her again for a long time. Um, so anyways, I'm at this pregnant rehab place and um, it's called Baby Love. And um, they told me that I had a visitor. And so I was like, I highly doubt it. <laughs> And so I went to go see who it was and it was my mom. And she was sitting at this table with thousands of dollars of baby stuff and baby clothes and toys and bottles and all this stuff. And she was like, Ashley, I'll help you 
I'll take custody of your son so that the state doesn't take him. And uh, at that moment, me and my mom's relationship was completely, it, it was mended. So I ended up leaving the treatment center. Uh, I let my addiction trick me into thinking that I needed to go be with my baby and all this stuff. And uh, it wasn't long before I was back with my boyfriend, back on fentanyl and back in the streets homeless. Um, once again, I, I gave up everything for my boyfriend at the time and for Deb. Um, within a week, I had spent $6,000 on uh, drugs and hotel rooms. Um, our criminal lifestyle began to progress far worse than it had ever before. Uh, we were fighting worse than before. Um, uh, pretty much can say that uh, my life couldn't have felt any more like hell at that point. The last time I ever saw him was in yet another high-speed chase and where it ended with me running on foot and I was able to get away, but he wasn't. And um, he was eventually caught and sentenced to several years in prison. Um, after he was gone, I was alone. I was living in cheap motels, escorting, getting high with any random junkie that I came across. I was in a really bad car wreck and I broke my back in three places. And it was so bad. I was so badly addicted that I woke up in ICU with a broken back. And... My only thought was, I gotta get out of here so I can get some dope. And I remember the lady telling me, if you move, you can be paralyzed from the waist down. And uh, as soon as she left the room, I unhooked all my IVs and put my back brace on and I walked out the door. And um, within an hour, I was in a hotel room getting high again with a broken back. I couldn't get away from heroin. I just couldn't. Uh, it literally had me. When I tell you it had me in bondage, it had me in unbreakable chains. Uh, it was destroying me. It was out to kill me. It was one of Satan's tools to destroy me because he knew that God had a great purpose on my life. And uh, I hadn't seen it yet, but he didn't want me to succeed in anything that was about to happen. I suffered pretty much like for six months in excruciating pain, unable to like stand or walk or do anything, but like literally lay down. And uh, so I moved in with my drug dealer and um, he was a very well-known drug dealer in North Memphis. Um, and I, I just couldn't function on my own. And um, I found myself living in the lowest possible rock bottom, surrounded by the shistiest, dirtiest, I mean, just like horrible people. The craziest junkies and gang members that I'd ever been around. Um, I was doing endless amounts of drugs. I was getting free drugs given to me. Um, and it's like, no matter how much I had, like I never seemed to get any higher. And I realized at one point that I had done like all this dope and I still felt like nothing, completely nothing. I was experience, experiencing derealization where I felt completely meaningless in the grand scheme of the universe. And I knew that my life literally was nothing at all. Um, I didn't look like myself even further than before. I didn't, I mean, it got to the point that I, I literally completely looked like an entirely different human being. It was endless torture. I knew, uh, no matter how much dope I had, it never brought me peace. No, you know, it never, it never set me free like I thought it would. You know, every junkie thinks that they're gonna finally feel free and they don't you know 
Uh, most people, when they finally feel free, it's because they're they're gone and they didn't make it. And we're also searching for that that peace and that release, and you'll find it. You know, you'll find it whether you decide to, you know, find your purpose and get clean, or if you decide to take it in death. Uh, I was arrested again uh, that following New Year's for grand theft, possession of meth, and several other heavy charges. And in jail, I began praying and reading my Bible, and I knew that I didn't want to go back to drugs. I mean, I went through this so many times. I don't want to do drugs. Why do I keep doing this to myself? And uh, I kept praying, and I kept praying, and eventually my case was dismissed for lack of prosecution because my officers didn't show up to my um, my hearing and I was facing like 20 years so it was uh, I knew that that was God also um, I knew that as soon as I got released I was like man God doesn't want me to like leave here and go do drugs and go back to doing the same thing I was doing but I know he did this but yeah I went straight back and uh, God pulled me back in jail a couple of weeks later for something else so uh he was like, nope, <laughs> you're going to sit down and listen. You're going to be still. You're going to hear my voice, and you're going to know that this isn't what I have for your life, and this isn't what you're supposed to be doing. I got out, and then in May of 2020, I overdosed on fentanyl five times in one week. And uh, I was around different people every single time, and I had to have three or more shots of Narcan to bring me back. And uh, I was still playing with fire and still thinking that I was literally going to get away with cheating death like all these times and it was just crazy um i knew around that time that it was about to be over like i had never overdosed that bad or that many times before in my life and um it was happening back to back to back and i i knew like i heard god tell me that you're about to die and it's gonna be over and your life literally is gonna be nothing um, it's gonna all be have been for nothing at all and I knew that wasn't right like I knew that I knew that deep down I was a good person and I knew that I had potential and I knew that I had talents and gifts but I didn't know how to use them and I didn't know I didn't feel like I was worthy of anything I literally didn't know how to be a functioning human being like I just felt trapped um, I didn't know how to live without drugs, and I knew that drugs were the problem. I just wanted to go back to jail again because I knew that jail was the only place I was going to hear God's voice. It was the only place I was going to be able to detox. It was the only place that my parents would speak to me, and it was the only place that I would get into rehab, that, that it's the only place I would even have a chance to even remotely start over, and I hated jail. I mean, I avoided it at all costs, did crazy things to people. I mean psycho things to avoid going to jail escaping jail high speed chases at 125 miles an hour i mean anything to not go there like anything but that i mean at that you know at that point in my addiction like i would have rather died than go to jail and then it got to the point where i was like dude please put me in jail because this is nuts august of 2020 i was finally arrested for a warrant that i had um, after I got in a vehicle with a man uh, who was wanted for the rape and murder of several women and children. Uh, I literally just needed a ride and I didn't have a ride and I had a warrant so I saw some random person and I was like hey can you give me and my friend a ride and come to find out the uh, Memphis sex crime people were after this man for literally murdering all these people and me and my friend were next on his list and we are about to be dead and once again God intervened in my life and the officers pulled up and they all drew guns and they took him away and I went to jail too and I knew in handcuffs in the back seat of that car that it was finally over. I knew that my addiction was finally done and I knew that God had answered my prayers and I knew that this wasn't coincidence, that it was divine appointment and I knew that I was being saved. And even though it was something I didn't want to do and it was uncomfortable, I knew that that's where it had to start.
during the four months that I was locked up, uh, a revelation came over me. And um, I was pretty accepting of the fact that I was going to have to go back up to four years and serve the four, the time that I, you know, was going to have to do. I mean, I had like four probation violations at this point. And uh, that doesn't really happen. You usually get like two and then it's a wrap. But I got somehow four and I was ready to go to the penal farm. And my attorney was like, we're, we're gonna give you another chance. And I remember just being like, but why? Like I've ran from every rehab you've put me in. I've caught new charges, like this doesn't make sense. And I knew that once again, that was God too. That wasn't man's decision. And I was sitting in my bunk, reading my Bible and things just changed. I realized how amazing it was to wake up and not be dope sick. Um, how amazing it was to be free of codependency. How lovely it was to be able to talk to my parents on the phone, to talk to my daughter on the phone. Um, I realized that I hadn't enjoyed simplicity in so long. It's like decade, a decade without simplicity, without life. And uh, it was so beautiful once I found it. I became comfortable there in, in jail, in my cell, uh, a place that I'd always been so terrified to go. Um, and I realized that freedom has nothing to do with where, where you are geographically. It has nothing to do with your, with your circumstances. It's all about your spiritual, your spirituality. It's how you're, when you are set free inside. And, um, I remember the chains like falling off of me and even though I was confined in that cell like I was totally set free I was reading my Bible and all of a sudden I saw this place and it was a like a faith-based rehab place but it wasn't like a facility it was more like a home and it was in the country and it wasn't in Memphis and I remember seeing this black dog and I remember knowing like a deep knowing deep within that this was the place that was going to change my entire life that this is the place i was meant to go and i instantly knew i wasn't going to get sentenced the judge wasn't going to sentence me because god had this plan for me and he wouldn't have showed me this if he hadn't meant for this to happen so it looked like i was going to go serve time but despite what it looked like um i knew that i was going to go to this place whatever it was wherever it may be my attorney surprised me and told me, you know, they were giving me another chance. The judge approved. And, um, anyways, they sent me to this uh, temporary rehab until my friend told me about Warrior Center. And, um, so my mom took me to Warrior Center on, uh, January of 2021. And, uh, I had the desire to know God when I got there, but I didn't have a full relationship with him. And as soon as I walked through the doors, I remember seeing their black dog, Bibi. Um, she was a black pit bull lab mix and she was the same exact dog I saw in the vision. And um, I knew as soon as I saw her and I realized and each day more and more things I would learn about the program, they matched perfectly with my vision and I knew that this place was the place that God was trying to send me to, that he was trying to tell me about. And um, I knew that that's where I needed to be, that I had to be still and be there, and that my whole life was gonna completely change. I wanted God, but it was so hard for me to be patient, for me to sit through the classes, you know, to just not run, because all I had ever done was run from every single thing. And um, I would cry and like beg myself, please don't leave here, you know, like, please, like, the hell is wrong with you? Just stay here. I have to make myself stay. And I eventually became comfortable and I stayed long enough that I didn't have to fight my mind anymore, that I, you know, adjusted to it and fell in love with it. And it started, you know, just, it just became part of my life. And so about three months into the program, I messed up and I drank alcohol. We got caught and in the mountains of Bristol, Tennessee, I held my arms apart. I spread them wide apart 
and I looked into the mountains and I prayed and I said, God, please change me. Please make me good. And I, I begged him to just make me be normal, like just to take away my desire for alcohol, drugs, whatever it was that I wanted, what void I was trying to fill, I don't know, but I just begged him and I said, please change me. And at that moment, I completely surrendered everything to him, everything. That same day back in Memphis, my son was taken out of my mom's custody um, and he was placed with a foster family. And uh, I remember one of the staff members at the center telling me, just smiling while I was bawling my eyes out. And she said, I'll never forget. She said, wait and see what he does. Just wait and see. And um, I was like, dude, this lady's nuts. Like my life is falling apart again and it's crashing and she wants me to, she's smiling and laughing while I'm like having a mental breakdown right now. And, uh, but for the first time in my life, I actually decided to take her advice. I took somebody else's advice for the first time ever. And I waited and I was still, and I waited to see what he would do. I started to see things from a completely different perspective. Um, I waited and I focused on my work. I was hungry for God's word because in it I found everything that I'd ever wanted my spirituality to be. Everything that I searched for and all those other dark arts and stuff, you know, and drugs. I found everything in Jesus. And uh, something that I had pushed away my entire life, something I had been so against. Like I had a prejudice against Christianity for a long time. Um, and because of my past and past experiences with people, you know, and I realized that that one thing that I had refused to believe in, refused to have anything to do with was the one thing that was going to save my life. I found peace beyond what I can even explain in words. And uh, though it looked like through worldly eyes that my son was gone and he was going to be taken by the state, I knew he wasn't. I knew that it was part of God's plan to return my little man to me. And um, my faith just began to soar like never before. And I believed that God was good. And I began to hear, hear his quiet, still voice in every single thing. And I began to see the words, his promises everywhere. And I just trusted him. And I knew that, you know, sometimes God has to break things down to build them back up. And I knew that it was all part of that plan. And so, um, shortly after this, I, I began to see anchors everywhere. I saw them everywhere in the most unusual places, like on the, on a, a shirt's tag or like the bottom of a cup or in a book or just somewhere, like just some random place. I would see anchors literally 17, 18 times a day. It was freaking me out, like they were everywhere. My friend asked me if I had prayed and asked God what the anchors meant. I prayed and I asked God, what do these anchors mean? And like, I stand up and I sit back down in my chair and all of a sudden our A&D director comes up and <laughs> I had asked her what anchors meant, like if they were in the Bible like, mm, like weeks ago. But I thought she forgot and she never said anything to me about it. So right after I get done asking God in prayer what anchors meant and why he was showing them to me. And all of a sudden she hands me this stack of papers. And I look at it and the stack is every Bible verse that ever that mentions anchors. Um, the definition, what it what they symbolize in ancient times, um, what they mean in Christianity. Um, Every synonym, some of the synonyms were like hope, steadfast, safety, protector, strength. And <clears throat> it was as if God had just like sent me a, a freaking email, you know, like he just sent me the answer right there. And all I had to do was ask. I knew that I was holding tangible evidence in my hand that God was real. And I knew that he was telling me that I was safe, that he was the anchor to my soul that there was hope, that I had to be the anchor to my family, um, that even though that through the storms, I wouldn't be shaken. And in August of 2021, um, my best friend, JC, uh, died of a heroin overdose. And 
This was my third close friend to leave me in this life, but the first one to die from my drug of choice. It was hard, but my faith and trust in God saved me and got me through it. My life has changed so drastically since January 2021. I see God in everything, and I realize now that He was with me through every moment that I was lost. I see now that He was protecting me, reaching down to me, saving me, waiting for me to realize my calling. I know now that everything I went through came with a purpose so that I can help other people who are going through the same thing, um, that I can understand, that I can know exactly what they're going through. I wanna bring other people to Christ and let them know that there is a way out, that there is hope. It's when you feel like there's literally none left, I promise you there is. And um, for the first time in my life, I don't hate myself. I don't hate people. I don't worry about what's to come. Um, I do what's right. I no longer just do what I want. I do what is right. Um, I have discernment and it's so strong and it's beautiful. It's like the intuition that I always dreamed of having through all those dark arts and stuff. And it's nothing compared to the discernment I have through Christ. He's made my heart whole again. I am unbroken. I am hopeful and nothing can ever take that away from me. Now I am teaching classes at Warrior Center. I'm the boot camp director. I've graduated the program. I completed a year and I can I plan to continue s staying with them. They're my that's my family and uh, that place has shown me so much grace and mercy. Um, and, and that has truly saved my life. And I know that God sent me there and I know that I'm called to be there. And every day I teach classes, I teach Bible classes. Um, I've learned so much insight on the Bible and um, I help women every day, you know, and I help them stay. And I have so many people come up to me and tell me that they're inspired by me or that I'm the reason that they stayed or whatever and you know that's crazy and it's beautiful and it's given me such great purpose and um let's see i am so close to having custody of my son back i plan to hopefully um around april i'm hoping to have custody back i'm gonna have my own apartment soon i have a real job um I have actual things, you know, and it's not just material things. I have spiritual gifts. I have this amazing personality that I love, and I have so much love through Christ. I have friends that I never could have dreamed of having that are the best friends I could have ever had. My relationship with my daughter is completely mended. She's my, she's my mini me, she's my best friend. My relationship with my parents is mended. They didn't talk to me for three years straight, no contact whatsoever. And now I talk to them every day. And when I talk to them, it's like for an hour straight. And um, my parents are just, they're so proud of me. I am so proud of me. And I know that it's not me, that it's God that did all of this. I tried all these things to get me sober and nothing did but God. God is the foundation and I don't, you know, I'm not saying anything about people who choose it differently, but I know permanency in sobriety is found in God. I never really found what gave my life purpose until I surrendered my life to Christ and had it not been for the darkness, I would have never known what the light truly was. And once the light began to shine in my life, the darkness faded away, leaving me with what I had always longed for, to be fully alive.